Thank you, Rory. Uh, it's a delight to be here on this very special occasion in Sydney and uh, deeply impressed by the Australian Navy's organization of this uh, massive uh, gathering here the last few days. Uh, yesterday, uh, we heard uh, about uh, the Asian century being the maritime century. Uh, I think the central idea out there, I think, is for the first time, you have the Asian powers in a position to influence uh, their own maritime environment, uh, more popularly known as the Vasco da Gama age, where the European great powers came and shaped the maritime environment uh, in Asia. Now, with the uh, growth of Asia, Asia's power, and the emergence of new powers in Asia, uh, and their growing uh, determination to build strong navies, uh, we are at a very different moment uh, in this part of the world. And I think uh, as the Asian powers uh, build big navies, of course, India is going to be uh, one of the uh, key players in this part of the world uh, in terms of uh, expanded uh, naval engagement. Now, over the last uh, two decades, I mean, India has steadily expanded its uh, growing na its naval capabilities. Uh, it's begun to uh, engage, that's the word this morning, uh, engagement. Its engagement has spanned uh, the entire uh, Indian Ocean and beyond. Uh, some of its naval diplomacy has uh, stretched from uh, southern Africa uh, to South China Sea, uh, from eastern Mediterranean uh, to the uh, East China Seas. So what you have is uh, almost like a burst of activity the last 20 years. The, the Indian Navy uh, has been in the forefront uh, with, with a significant uh, uh, diplomatic engagement uh, with uh, many countries of the, of the literal and beyond. A morning, we talked about Ken Booth's uh, book. In fact, many things he talks about in terms of naval diplomacy, what do countries do with naval diplomacy, uh, many of those are present in terms of what India has done uh, in the last few years, whether it is the deployment of its navy in significant numbers, which has been doing in uh, South China Sea, for example, from 2080, uh, the ability to conduct uh, far sea operations, whether it is the Gulf of Aden anti-piracy activities, or uh, the tsunami relief uh, in Eastern Indian Ocean at the end of 2005, uh, whether it is the relief activities uh, in Libya, uh, or uh, the joint exercises that it has done with large number of countries uh, around the Indian Ocean littoral. Uh, all these uh, are classic acts of, of uh, naval diplomacy. Uh, what, I, what I propose to do is, uh, in my paper, uh, essentially, uh, explain the sources of uh, India's naval diplomacy uh, that's begun to emerge. Uh, look at, under, try to understand the what is the maritime imperative uh, that is driving India today. And then look at some of the uh, policy transitions uh, that India must complete to be an effective uh, a player in uh, naval diplomacy uh, in this part of the world. Uh, the Navy, the Indian Navy has uh, seized the big moment. Uh, it is very active. But I think our rest of our political system, our bureaucratic class, still have to catch up uh, in terms of getting that shared uh, all-government vision in terms of how the Indian Navy can be used uh, for uh, diplomatic and political purposes. First, looking at the, the, the essential source of uh, India's uh, maritime engagement in the last two decades, uh, it is the, the source of it is really the, the historic transition that India has made from being a closed economy uh, to an open one. Uh, that it is, it is not a surprise that India's naval diplomacy uh, has accompanied uh, India's opening up uh, to the world. Because for the, till 1991, for nearly four decades, five decades, uh, India was largely a closed economy. Uh, and the reforms that India has done since the last two decades are the ones uh, that have created the basis for uh, expanded uh, naval engagement. Uh, and what this has done, the, the, the transformation of the Indian economy has fundamentally changed the nature of India's interests. Uh, just to give you one example, I mean, three decades ago, uh, India's total two-way trade was around $30 billion uh, annually. We're talking about a whole year, uh, $30 billion a year. Now, last year, we've done $750 billion. Uh, you can multiply it about 25 times, whatever it is, the, the growth. And that the dramatic expansion of uh, uh, the Indian trade, uh, you also recognize, if you look at the, uh, the volume of trade and related to the GDP, 
Uh, out of a GDP of 1.8 trillion, if $750 billion is the, is the imports and exports, you have 40% of India's GDP today is exposed to the global economy. This is an extraordinary condition. It's not the condition that, that India was in 20 years ago. And it is this change in the nature of the Indian economy uh, with this dramatic exposure to the rest of the world uh, fundamentally uh, alters the way uh, India will eventually uh, define its national interests. And, uh, and more importantly, uh, the, the, the recognition that the, this dispersed global interest of India uh, demand a strong navy and greater naval engagement uh, with, the, with the rest of the world. Uh, of course, this new uh, emphasis on Navy uh, is, of course, is a, is, a, is a departure from the great continentalist tradition that India has had. Uh, and uh, it is still a struggle for many of us within the country to come to terms with the, the new maritime imperative. But there we are uh, beginning to embark on this uh, journey. So the, the Indian naval diplomacy, as I said, has been very active. But there are at least five policy transitions that India has got to make. And I think this is work in progress, and the struggle uh, continues in terms of the, the debate within and the contending arguments uh, between uh, different parts of the, uh, the Indian government. The first transition that India must do uh, is the traditional is to move from the traditional emphasis on strategic autonomy to one of gaining strategic influence. Autonomy is for those who want to insulate themselves from the influence of the rest of the world. But given the nature of the Indian economy today, what India needs is the ability to influence the outside world. Uh, but the logic of this is, is fundamentally different. And I think the, the challenge today in India is, uh, while the traditionalists will continue to talk about non-alignment strategic autonomy, uh, those navalists at least are beginning to say, look, we've got to engage the world, we've got to change the world, we've got to influence the world in a way that our economy can grow and our interdependence with the rest of the world uh, can, be, can be managed. And this is also leads to the whole question that some in the world today see uh, India as a potential balancer uh, of the uh, major powers in this part of the world. But the traditionalists would say, look, we don't want to get into the game we want to limit ourselves to being neutral or non-aligned in the contestation between the great powers. But what Indian naval diplomacy has laid the foundation for is one in which India can influence and shape the future maritime balance of power uh, in, uh, in this part of the world. The second transition I think uh, India will need to do uh, is the traditional emphasis on sea denial to one of power projection. Now, in the past, you know, India's emphasis was on the territorial defense of its own waters and to deny them uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the others. And uh, uh, at that point, I mean, I think you had this whole emphasis on the uh, Indian Ocean as a zone of peace uh, and how the great powers must keep out of the uh, Indian Ocean. But today, when the Indians are talking about, at least the navalists talk about India's interests now stretching from the Aden to Malacca, uh, and the need to protect those interests demands a very a different approach. And that's why you've seen the tension between uh, those who say, uh, we've got to stay home, protect your own waters, to those who are arguing that India has an opportunity today to shape, to influence uh, uh, outcomes uh, around the Indian Ocean littoral. Now, one of the issues relating to uh, power projection, of course, we're still some distance away from it, but what power projection needs is to cultivate special relationships, to develop partnerships across the region, and to be able to contribute to uh, outcomes in different parts of the world. And some of that we're beginning to see where the Indian Navy has established relationships for uh, the ability to operate uh, far from its shores. Because once India is doing far sea operations, uh, to be able to carry them out effectively, uh, it needs building special relationships, which of course runs counter to the the traditional notion of uh, neutrality and non-alignment. The third transition that India has to complete is one from the traditional emphasis on national security to one of contributing to regional security. Because historically, as, as part of our tradition of non-alignment and self-reliance, the emphasis was on our own security. But today, this idea that India can be a security provider 
uh, in the Indian Ocean region. And that idea is gaining ground, and that involves actually expanding naval assistance, uh, helping smaller countries to build their capabilities, uh, and creating a range of instruments that would contribute to, that would help India to contribute to uh, the, uh, the regional security. Uh, for example, in the morning, I mean, if you look, go back to Ken Booth, uh, he talks about naval aid. Uh, India's naval assistance has significantly increased. It has been giving ships to some of the smaller countries. There's more training today that India does uh, to across the board uh, from Vietnam uh, to Seychelles that India today is engaged and embarked on uh, providing naval aid, naval assistance in, in ways in which it would, not, it would be unthinkable uh, two decades ago. But still, there are much more to be done for India to be able to effectively contribute uh, to regional security. Uh, it needs better instruments. It needs a stronger domestic defense industrial base. It needs the capacity to export arms. Uh, many of those are still absent in India. But then uh, that is the direction in which I believe uh, India will eventually move. That brings me to the, the fourth transition that India has to do. That is the the traditional emphasis on extending sovereignty over its territorial seas, or seas adjacent to it, to one of today emphasizing the maritime domain as a global commons. Uh, those of us in the law of the sea who participated in the 70s, the emphasis was on extending the Indian territorial sovereignty into the waters. And that's partly the reason why you had uh, the whole range of uh, 200 nautical mile uh, extended economic zone and all the other developments that came. But today India is talking about, the Indian Navy's maritime strategy says freedom to use the seas. Uh, spoken like a true trading nation. Uh, all major trading nations, it's not about closing your waters. It's about keeping the waters of the world open. That's a fundamental shift, mental shift. We hope one day the Chinese will get there as well. But the fact that imagining the world's waters as a single whole and that they must be available for use by everyone. Uh, this is a very different approach than the approach that India had taken in the past. And we see some of that uh, beginning to uh, emerge in the, uh, in, the, in the Indian debate. Uh, so the, the, the shift uh, from territorialization to envisaging a global maritime commons uh, is, is an important one, but of course, this again uh, needs to go much further in the, in the coming years. The final transition uh, that India is, is engaged in is from the notion of regional exclusivism to open-ended cooperation. You go back to the 70s, Indian Ocean as a zone of peace. Our general slogan was, look, if only the great powers got out of the Indian Ocean, it'll be a happy place. The lion will lie down with the lamb. Everybody is going to be happily live ever after. Uh, but I think the, the Indians did not fully understand this argument that getting the great powers out of the Indian Ocean was seen by many as India's own attempt at winning primacy in the Indian Ocean. And the, and the slogan was seen with great suspicion. Uh, but today what India is doing is not to seek the elimination of the presence of the major powers in the Indian Ocean, whether it is the United States or China, but to go out and engage all the major powers who can make a difference uh, to the outcomes in the region. This is a fundamentally different approach and which has begun to influence India's maritime diplomacy by opening up to engagement with all the major powers and the regional actors. And the purpose is to construct uh, support for a set of core principles like freedom of navigation, uh, f freedom to use the seas, rather than the idea that some people must be kept out of uh, Indian Ocean. So these five transitions uh, essentially mark a significant shift in India's own worldview and how India looks at the, the maritime domain. But as I said, this is work in progress. Uh, to conclude then, the principal challenge for India, I think, in the coming years is going to be, how does it shift from being a lone ranger to a coalition builder? Because historically, the non-alignment, policy of non-alignment largely meant uh, we're going to do our own thing. I go, you know, do it my way. We're not really uh, interested in doing anything with anybody else. So the profound military isolationism that gripped India for almost four and a half decades, that is now coming to an end. And we're beginning to see 
uh, the, the outlines of an approach where India is beginning to work with major powers as well as regional actors to construct coalitions. How these coalitions will be constructed? Ad, some ad hoc, some enduring, some permanent, that uh, is going to be the, the big challenge. And I think what we're going to see is that the transition is incomplete, as I said, but a journey has begun, a journey in which India is going to move from one of uh, an inward-looking approach to one which is seeks more cooperation, more engagement with the other powers as well as its neighbors in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you.